Um, so I guess we should start by addressing this fact that, you know, people have clicked on this video or in this podcast because they saw John Horgan, Deepak Chopra, and they're seeing John Horgan and, you know, that one Russian dude from Plugin Heads. So the reason this is happening, there's going to be Deepak in a little bit. Uh, people can fast forward to that if they're watching a video of this, there's like a timestamp in the video description so they can skip through this part. But what this part is about I guess is two things, right? First, we are officially launching a John Horrigan podcast called Mind Body Problems, which is the continuation of the book that she wrote, which is available online for free at mindbodyproblems.com. And I'm pretty excited about it, partly because, you know, I, I did some work uh, convincing you that there should be a podcast like that. You already have a couple of conversations lined up. So this first has Deepak, and then there are going to be more people. Uh, what is your vision for this? What are you? What are your expectations, and what are you uh, planning on doing with this thing? Well, I so when I um, as I started writing this book, Mind Body Problems, I realized that I'd been thinking about worrying about the mind body problem my entire life, and uh, I will be worrying about it, talking about it, thinking about it, brooding over it for the rest of my life. Right. And um, I, I love talking about it. It's the deepest mystery that there is. And so uh, when you and, and Bob Wright suggested that uh, I have some conversations here on Meaning of Life TV about it, um, I jumped at the chance. I mean, the first conversation was with you, Nikita, and that was a lot of fun for me. So now I'm hoping I can talk to at least a few of the people I interviewed for my book because my, you know, my book is structured around these um, portraits I have of people who have uh, wrestled with the, the mind-body problem in some professional way and have also wrestled with it on a personal, private level. So I'll talk to anybody who wants to, pretty much. Um, what happened with Deepak Chopra is that um, he, I'd never really had any interaction with him. Of course, I knew who he was. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I had written some things that were really disparaging of hardcore materialists and atheists, people like mm -hmm. Richard Dawkins and, and uh, Lawrence Krauss and uh, by Mike Shermer. Um, and, uh, and so then Chopra reached out to me, probably thinking the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And uh, we had some exchanges on, I don't know, Twitter, I think. And I, I had to tell him that I, you know, just because I was mean to some people who were mean to him, didn't mean that I agreed with his own positions on uh, the mind body problem and the nature of reality. Um, and and you know, he, he said he understood that, but he still wanted to invite me to this conference called Sages and Scientists. And I'm not a scientist, so I, I assumed that that meant that I got to be a sage. And so I went to his conference. Also, he, he paid me what for me is a lot of money, and he put me up in a really nice hotel, the Beverly Wilshire, which is, I think it's the nicest hotel I've ever stayed in. And um, just to show that he hadn't bought me off, I, I gave a talk at the meeting that was very critical of him um, and especially of his, his worldview, which says that uh, matter isn't the basis of reality. Mind is the basis of reality. Consciousness is the basic basis of reality. This is a, I see this as a kind of Eastern mystical uh, metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, parts of that appeal to me, it, the, it appeals to the part of me that's taken a lot of psychedelics and that has felt that I'm just, you know, this little node in an infinite field of consciousness that pervades the entire universe. But the, the, the nasty, skeptical, scientific American part of me uh, thinks that that's nonsense and that materialism, of course, is the correct framework for understanding the world. And so I gave a talk saying that 
there were all these trends in science uh, towards saying that consciousness is somehow primary or at least um, is fundamental to reality, as fundamental as, uh, as matter is. And I, say, I called these ideas, I lumped them under this term called neo-geocentrism uh, because saying that consciousness somehow is intrinsic to reality strikes me as being um, the kind of narcissistic idea uh, that we had centuries or millennia ago where we assume that we're the center of the universe. And uh, I thought that one of the great triumphs of science is to get us out of that narcissism and help us see that, um, that we're probably just these insignificant little strange kinds of matter that happen to have arisen on this one little mode of dust in a remote part of uh, the universe. So, um, you know, I said this kind of stuff at the meeting. And the thing is, Chopra was just still really nice to me. You know, he was, <laughs> he was very gracious. So I, I felt kind of like an asshole afterwards. And, um, and also, uh, Chopra is not a, a, he's not on the fringe and, and saying these kinds of things about consciousness possibly being primary or at least as fundamental as matter. A lot of other people are saying that. Um, some of the people I interviewed in my book were saying things that were in that ballpark, in, including uh, Christoph Koch, a neuroscientist mm -hmm. uh, who believes in panpsychism, uh, Stuart Kaufman, um, who uh, has a quantum theory of consciousness that says that because of, because of these quantum effects, consciousness pervades the entire universe. So... Um, Lots of people are saying this, not just Deepak Chopra. Another thing that worries me about Chopra is that the, he, in saying that mind is really uh, primary, it makes it, that's a very um, comforting idea. And also it's a nice compliment to his, a lot of his spirituality plus health shtick, which says that, um, if we um, have positive attitudes and we recognize how powerful our minds are, that we can overcome some of our physical and uh, mental problems. That is the, the troubling part, right? For, for yeah. many people, because then the implication of this world, this, you know, in preparation for this, I was just thinking about where do we draw the line with, last time we talked, you and I talked, you said that you kind of opened up to uh, some of these uh, stranger ideas of, about what's going on. Um, but there must be a line somewhere. There are some things that probably you still don't accept or don't tolerate. And then it's, a, it's an interesting question to figure out where we draw that line. And so one place where many people draw that line is like practical implications of worldviews. And so health is one of those places. So it, it, I think this is like on Wikipedia, if you go to just Deepak Chopra's page, page on Wikipedia, the controversy is largely about that. Do you know much about his stance on, on healthcare? There is like some idea that we can heal ourselves from all kinds of illnesses, including cancer, if we just get the right attitude or something? Yeah, um, I see this now as, look, the placebo effect we know is very powerful. Right. The placebo effect is a really important part of the effectiveness of lots of different um, treatments, some of which are completely conventional mainstream treatments. If you look at psychiatry, I'd say that the placebo effect is probably the, the primary ingredient of psychotherapy and even of, uh, even of medications. Um, Bob Wright. Uh, whom I very much respect, is uh, promoting Buddhism now as, um, as a treatment for anxiety and, and other problems. And I see that as very much in the ballpark of the kinds of things that Deepak Chopra is talking about. Um, I've written a lot about the placebo effect in the past, and I have denigrated uh, psychiatry for not being open in its um, 
exploitation of the uh, uh, placebo effect, I've always felt a little comfortable, uncomfortable about being so critical because, you know, if I, if I tell people, oh, it's just the placebo effect and it's, this, this isn't a real treatment, then it actually might make the treatment right. less effective. So it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of an ethical quandary uh, for me. I always felt weird about the phrase, it's just a placebo effect. Because yeah. it's like, we say that and it's like, oh, okay, so I shouldn't pay attention to that. While, can you explain the placebo effect to me? Why right. the hell is a pill that doesn't have any active ingredient actually changes a person's health? It's like, it's not just a placebo effect. It's the, this mysterious, weird effect that we should pay attention to and try to figure it out, right? Yeah, um, I, I guess what's really changed in my attitude over the last few years um, is that I have just become much more open-minded and tolerant of lots of different views. I mean, you know, you said before, where should we draw the line? I don't draw the line at Christianity. I don't draw mm -hmm. the line at uh, Islam or, or um, Judaism or Hinduism or, or Buddhism. I used to be really critical of Buddhism and and um, as you know, I, I went on a Buddhist retreat over the summer that, that blew me away. Um, and so now my attitude is, um, is just, uh, you know, people should try what works for them. And um, what Deepak Chopra is telling people obviously works for a lot of people. Um, I tend to be very sort of hyper, almost compulsively skeptical. So that kind of stuff doesn't work for me very well. Um, but um, I'm just not as, I'm not as uh, critical of it as I once was. And I also, I guess I see Deepak Chopra now as somebody who is trying to figure shit out the way that the rest of us are. A difference between us is that he really has a point of view where I, I am still in a state of confusion and looking around for uh, things that might work for me or for other people. Um, and I could criticize him for being too dogmatic and sure of himself, uh, but that's true of a lot of other right. people too, including some of the people that, uh, that I interviewed for my book. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, I don't see any reason why I, I should uh, shun Deepak Chopra or not talk to him um, any more than I should avoid other people whose views I disagree with, but whom I respect. And I think mm -hmm. that they're acting in good faith. You said he's trying to figure shit out. That seems to be like one of the, uh, another good place to draw the line, or at least if, maybe there are different lines, but one of them is whether a person is actually sincere in, in the message that they're putting forward. I listened to the conversation that you had with Deepak already, and I, I think you said that you previously saw him as kind of businessman, guru type person. Yeah. When you're a businessman, consciously or subconsciously, you know, you're, you have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, God damn, I sometimes forget English words. Uh, a bias? And then, yeah, a bias or an incentive to, you know, promote your worldview that promote a worldview that would allow you to continue benefiting from, you know, the spread of the books or the treatments. Yeah. Um, so was there like a change in your perception of his from he might be full of shit to no, he's actually <laughs> a sincere? Yeah, actually, the, the, the phrase would be ulterior motive. Um, mm -hmm. Are his ideas just uh, in the service of pushing product. Right. Um, the thing is, all of us are pushing product in a way. I'm pushing product. Uh, I think all of us are, you know, we have different reasons for being committed to particular um, ideas. I, I didn't want to be in the position of, of uh, criticizing Chopra because he's really good at promoting his ideas. Right. I think that's what some struggling intellectuals end up doing that they, um, you know, they look at some of the people who are writing books about, uh, in, in Chopra's case, about 
medicine and, and spirituality and you know the nature of of the universe and if they see that they've they've got tremendous sales and the books are best sellers then you know we we assume that um there's got to be something wrong with it and um in this new sage-like wise state post buddhist retreat uh that i have attained um i just don't want to be as judgmental uh, uh, of people and also i just like talking to the guy so what can i say um and i i'm glad that he uh he wanted to talk to me and uh he gave me a platform uh for um for my own views as well as making his very clear so right. um yeah i guess you know, those are all the reasons why uh i was happy very happy to talk to deepak chopra I, I as i said i already listened to the conversation i thought it was really interesting and honest like it's a it's an actual like you the two of you were struggling with this whole crux of issues the mind body problem um i guess the last kind of broad question that i had for you is i mean yeah so you are now more open to different kinds of ideas and in case with deepak in particular you just laid out reasons to not dismiss him and uh to, to to talk to him is there still somewhere a line even if there is no like harm from somebody's worldview like i you know i have in the last conversation i had uh with you you asked me about how do you integrate psychedelic experiences and i said i talked to different kinds of people about my insights and some of them are like materialists you know very down to earth grounded in reality people mm -hmm. some are they're not diagnosed with schizophrenia because doctors haven't gotten to them yet <laughs> and i find myself sometimes in conversations with you know people like that like i i, I actually value those conversations a lot because if if I'm talking to somebody who like we both know that my world uh, world is completely different from their world, uh, and and it's going to be difficult for us to find like shared space of ideas to actually talk to each other to try to help each other uh, if if one is in trouble uh, to to engage and to have some sort of a productive conversation. It's difficult, it's challenging because uh, it means that I can't dismiss that reality even though that reality is completely like bananas to me. Yeah. And then on the other hand, I can't just accept everything they say because then uh, I will not be able to engage with them. Part of the reason they're talking to me is because they want to be corrected sometimes. They want a check from somebody else. Yeah. Right? So you need to find this line of you're not judging and you're not uh dismissing somebody's worldview completely but you also don't accept everything uh because there needs to be that little bit of a tension for the conversation to be productive so i guess the question is like uh, is there some sort of a line when you just think i mean sometimes you meet a crazy person right what do you do with do you still go on well i'm trying to be open i went on a buddhist retreat I am, I have always, since I was really young, been fascinated by how other people see the world and the crazier the worldview is, the more fascinating I find it. So mm -hmm. I remember when I was a teenager, I, I sort of was this itinerant hippie, I wandered around the country and uh, there were these young hippies, many of whom had been into drugs and then they um, had become born again Christians. And, you know, we called them Jesus freaks back then. I love to talk to Jesus freaks. <laughs> and, you know, just because I found their, their ideas uh, so strange and I'd try to tell them why I couldn't believe the things that they believed. And, um, and you know, sometimes we can have a really interesting conversation. I guess the, the I would draw the line at, it's not the content of the beliefs, it's the level of certitude and dogmatism. There are mm -hmm. some people who are so absolutely sure that they're right about things that you can't really, you know, it's just totally one, one way, the conversation. And, uh, and that can be people who are 
absolute hardcore atheists and materialists who think that science has already pretty much explained the universe or fundamentalist uh, Christians or, or Muslims or fundamentalist Buddhists. Those kinds of people are out there as well. So, um, you know, because what I'm sort of trying to sell in my book is uh, doubt and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to point out that, um, you know, we have these extraordinary imaginations that can come up with all these different stories about the universe and about ourselves, uh, but we should never fool ourselves that we really know what's going on. Um, because, uh, you know, and, and I guess this is my dogmatism, um, if I have any, it's that we don't have a clue and that reality is just almost infinitely beyond our comprehension when you really get down to it. And, and, and so that means that people who really think they know what's going on, uh, whether it's with quantum field theory or with some kind of Hindu metaphysics, they're totally nuts to me. That's a good criteria. Um, well, I guess a, a general question, did uh, this conversation you had with Deepak, did it change your views in, in any way? Did, you, did he make you doubt something that you didn't doubt before? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of in the, in the position now of just, um, sort of fact gathering still or mm -hmm. gathering more points of view and the more the better. Uh, and that doesn't, it, it sort of enriches my point of view. Um, maybe complicates it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really change my feeling about what I was just talking about, about, you know, ultimately the unknowability of ourselves and the unknowability of, um, of reality in a way it just kind of deepens it the more point of view that I get. Because the more diversity of uh, viewpoints um, that there are, uh, I, I think that reinforces the, the idea that, you know, there can't be a single truth that captures what's going on. Should we tease people with some of the uh, conversations that you have already scheduled? What, what are other data points that are gonna be in this line of uh, episodes? I I'm reluctant to do that because I, I've been so technically klutzy lately. <laughs> all I know, I won't successfully record any conversations. But, um, but I do have a couple of the people that I, uh, I mean, I, I love talking to all of my subjects, but um, I've got a couple of subjects that I'm really fond of that have agreed to talk just within the next week or so. And uh, so I'm hoping that they will be posted within the next uh two or three weeks and that we can air these issues again do you have anything else to add to this or should we stop here and and uh guide people to the rest of the conversation between you yeah and i can't really i can't really think of anything i hope i i hope i haven't said anything i said i don't want to sound as though i'm sort of you know now that i'm talking to you instead right. of Chopra, that I'm, I'm condescending to him or acting. i don't think i did say anything like that oh okay all right that's good um so uh, no, I'd say you know people can now listen to me and Deepak fucking Chopra yammer <laughs> away about the meaning of life and make up their own minds whether we know anything at all or whether we're total idiots. And this is where the car would be. You know, I'm having a conversation with John Horgan about the mind-body problem. He's a science writer. Check out the website, read the book, it's free. And you don't get that uh, offer very frequently. And it's kind of a state-of-the-art uh, conversation about this whole area, the hard problem of consciousness. How does matter produce experience and everything we call everyday reality, this world that you're looking at. It's um, how does the brain give you the experience of this world. So John, uh, I'd like to kind of summarize some of the current thinking. Okay. And then we can see what your opinion is on each of these aspects. Okay. So let's start with number one. 
there is only matter. Let's call that monistic materialism. Okay, I asked um, Frank Wilczek, the Nobel laureate who discovered, uh, you know, some particle or the other, an <laughs> ion, and got a Nobel Prize. I've met him I, too. Okay, I asked him, um, you know, what is matter? What is the nature of matter? Because, first of all, the material atomic universe is only 4%, as you know. 96% is dark energy, dark matter. We don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. But of that 4% material atomic universe, it seems that most of it is invisible interstellar dust that we can't see. Yeah. So the physical universe, the visible universe, which now we are told 2 trillion galaxies, is 0.01%. So we are looking at 0.10% of what is presumably reality. Yeah. And then when we look at these atoms, we say they're made of particles. And what are they made of? They're smaller particles and particles and Higgs bosons and all this. But then we end up with a situation where these particles are also waves. And particles have units of mass and energy. And waves are waves of probability. And if you ask, uh, as I did, we'll check and others, uh, where do these waves exist that ultimately end up as the material universe, and they say very confidently they exist in Hilbert space. So you say, what is Hilbert space? And then depending on their take, they say it has infinite dimensions, or somebody says it has zero dimensions, but basically it houses the wave function. And what is the wave function? Oh, Schrodinger's equation, and it shows the evolution of a wave into different particles. Where is it? Well, ultimately, they say, shut up and calculate, right? <laughs> yeah. So when I asked Will check these questions, uh, at the end, he said, we are still trying to figure out the nature of matter. Yeah. You know, it's elusive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, do you agree that matter is not material in its source? I agree that matter is mysterious and um, that quantum mechanics uh, has a lot to do with that. Um, and and that the deeper scientists go into some of these issues, instead of getting clarification, they get deeper mystery. I totally agree with you on that. The question but does is matter material? That's my <laughs> question. Yeah. Well, it's is we, we the, know it's is not the stuff of the universe that we call matter non-stuff. Well, we know since Einstein that uh, matter is interchangeable with with uh, energy. energy. Um, I think one of the people I interviewed for my book, uh, Rebecca Goldstein, yeah, who is I've met her. she's brilliant, brilliant. and uh, trained in philosophy before she became a novelist, and she said that she thinks that matter is not giving up its secrets. Uh, she also is a panpsychist. She thinks that at some point we're going to look deeper and deeper into matter, and we're going to find consciousness down there somewhere. Christoph, of course, thinks they already have found consciousness lurking in matter. Um, I think this is part of the what I call the paradigm explosion. I think um, all these issues are up for grabs. I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, but I, th I do think that in the future, this is one of my predictions. This actually goes back to my first, my first book, The End of Science. I think things are just going to get weirder and weirder. I think we're going to realize the insufficiency of science in a really profound way. The more we learn, the more we're going to realize how little we know. That's the direction I think we're going. Okay, so at least one thing we've agreed on. <laughs> matter, the nature of matter is elusive. We don't fully understand what matter is. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the matter that is visible, that constitutes the universe, is a very small fraction of what reality might be. Yes. Okay, so we're looking at a very small segment of whatever reality is. Yeah. So I would say material monism is in trouble. Okay, <laughs> now my second theory, we'll come to panpsychism, is of course dualism, right? With Descartes and everybody else. Yeah. And that mind is separate from matter, mm -hmm. two different entities. I find that troubling because then how do I raise my arm? That starts with a thought. 
and this is a physical thing, right? The first step is an intention. So where does that intention come from? And how does it translate into electrochemical activity and then neuromuscular activity? And then my vocal cords vibrating right now and you and I having interaction. There are two different things. How they do they interact with each other? And I've talked to physicists about this and they say dualism violates fundamental laws like thermodynamics, mm -hmm. you know, where does, what is the medium of exchange between mind and matter? So right now, the most of the people that I talk to, they say dualism is gone, it's out. Uh, I never was a fan of dualism. Du dualism seems like just a label on stuff we don't understand. The key issue for me here is free will. A lot of modern scientists, including Francis Crick, to my distress, uh, because I really respected him. He didn't believe in free will. Yeah, and and without free will, I mean, I actually can live without God. I cannot live without free will. Life doesn't make any sense to me without seeing myself and other people as these creatures that have these things we call choices, where you can look into the future, you can see different paths in front of you, you can weigh the pros and cons of taking one path over the Chinese other. restaurant, Italian restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> or do you become a doctor or do you become a philosopher? Do you become yeah. a science writer? You know, uh, what kind of person uh, are you? Do you have choice you? in other words? Right. And moral choices, especially, I think, are um, impossible to understand uh, without free will. And we don't understand free will. We don't understand choices. But the scientists then go on to say, well, that means they don't exist. No, it just means that the material paradigm can't account for them. That means that there's this gaping hole in the middle of our understanding of ourselves. So then you're not a fan of dualism right now, you're saying that. Or materialism. Or I think. Material. I, I think. Okay, so we've got rid is. of two things. Materialism, <laughs> dualism. Now we're on to panpsychism. Okay, panpsychism yeah. says that everything has a little bit of consciousness. Right. Uh, from an atom to a galaxy. Yeah. Right? Uh, but uh, an integrated information theory is part of that in a sense. Yes. And of course, now super string theories, multiverses, eternal inflation, all of that is kind of in this realm, right? Yeah. In a way. Although people are still trying to see if there's, um, there's uh, a true connection between, say, panpsychism or string theory or multiverses and all that and it's at this moment i would say panpsychism is fashionable mm -hmm. but there's no scientific evidence for that would you no uh the problem here is i call it the solipsism problem i'm not sure what other philosophers or scientists call it it's so, it, it's, it's the problem of subjectivity so i know i'm conscious i'm experiencing my consciousness right now I can't be absolutely sure that you were conscious or any other person is conscious. I don't have direct... Or what their experience is, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I don't... This is one of the puzzling aspects of consciousness. I don't have direct um, uh, access to any other conscious uh, creature's mind. Um, I assume that you're conscious. I mean, it's just common sense tells me that. But then when we go to whether this table or a proton or a bacterium or even a skunk or a fish whether those are uh, conscious or a smartphone. These are the kinds of things that philosophers argue over endlessly. It's all moot because we can't know. Now, Christoph has actually talked about the possibility of a consciousness meter that can, I, I can point it at, at that little sculpture over there and it will tell me, yeah, there's, there's this much consciousness in there. That's a pipe dream to me. Uh, he's got these elaborate... Um, arguments for why a consciousness meter is possible, I don't think it is possible. Uh, so it means to me that a lot of these theories we have about consciousness, how pervasive it is, there's some philosophers who aren't even sure if humans are really conscious. Like Daniel Dennett, you've probably heard of this. Oh, yeah, we've this, had interactions. This crazy idea. A lot of interactions. He says that consciousness is an illusion. Douglas Hofstadter said that, that yeah. as well. And well, of course, we live in an illusion. But that doesn't mean that consciousness doesn't exist. I guess the point I want to I make, and that I try to make in my book, is that all this 
wild disagreement, all this enormous variety of ideas about what we are, about the nature of our mind and how we're related to the rest of the universe, tells me that we don't have a clue. We are so far beyond comprehension. Uh, part of this comes from psychedelics. The, the, the central, but I've also gotten it in meditation, the central epiphany that I've had is that reality is utterly incomprehensible. All of our ideas, all of our theories and theologies, all the art that we've come up with to express uh, our mystification and try to uh, answer it somehow, falls infinitely short of capturing what is actually going on right here at this very instant. You know, Sir Arthur Eddington, the famous um, astronomer who actually did the experiment to prove the general theory of relativity, Yeah. one of his most famous quotes is, um, something unknown is doing, we don't know what. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's good. Yeah. I could have had that as the slogan at the front of my book. Something. So you're not a fan of materialism. You're not a fan of dualism. It seems you're not a fan of panpsychism. And what you're saying is the problem is almost insolvable. But, um, again, this is something I try to show in my book. We have all these wonderful, I call them stories, um, stories about what we are. Uh, and that includes uh, Hinduism, um, Christianity, uh, Platonism. It includes evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, Science. artificial intelligence. Oh, We've got this enormous oh, array, and and some of them really work well. Mm. It's not I, the question shouldn't be, are they true? The question should be, are they work? Do they work? Do they do? They work, but are they true? Yeah, I, I don't care because I don't think we'll ever know I care. if anything if any if any of them is true. What matters is whether they console us, whether they help us make some kind of sense out of our lives, whether they uh, make life more meaningful to us, whether they help us see the beauty in life. And a lot of the ideas of the people in my book do that. They work. Also, some of the theories might have enormous practical consequences. They might help us overcome schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. They might help us enhance our abilities in the future, brain chips or genetic engineering that could... Augmented reality, make artificial us intelligence, yeah. all of that. So here is what I think. Bring it on. I'll bring it on. See, I've always wondered all my life, what is reality? Which it seems like you have too. So when I was in medical school, I came across this experiment where the scientists, and they won the Nobel Prize uh, for that or other experiments, I forget the exact, this is 1964 when I was in medical school. Mm -hmm. But these scientists took some kittens and they brought them up in a room that had only horizontal stripes. And then they took some other kittens, brought them up in the room that had vertical stripes. Yeah. And then these kittens grew up to be wise old cats. And one could see, one set of kittens could see only a horizontal world. The other group of kittens could see only a vertical world. And uh, of course, uh, when their brains were examined, they didn't have the connections between neurons to see either a vertical world or a horizontal world because that's what their conditioning was. Mm -hmm. They were conditioned, their brain was conditioned only to see horizontal stripes. So that's all they saw. They didn't see uh, anything that was horizontal. Mm -hmm. The other group of kittens couldn't see, for example, furniture legs. Yeah. And it had nothing to do with the belief system. It was just that the brain edited out what they hadn't been conditioned to experience. Mm -hmm. So my first insight was that the brain is conditioned to perceive. As humans, we are conditioned to perceive. When we are born, um, uh, you don't know that this is a candle. All you experience is a shape, or a sensation, or a smell, or a noise. 
and then somebody tells you that's a candle. Yeah. So now you say, oh, it's and it's made of wax, and this is made of glass, and that's matter, by the way. Okay. So that was my first insight that perception is a learned response. Mm -hmm. But then as I started exploring this, for example, I'm reading this book right now called uh, The Soul of an Octopus, okay? A surprising exploration into the wonder of consciousness. So, you know, I was looking, I'm making notes here, and this thing that's called uh, octopus, uh, it says, it's hard to find an animal more unlike a human than an octopus. Their bodies aren't organized like ours. We go head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. Their mouths are in their armpits. So if you prefer uh, to liken their arms to our lower instead of upper extremities between their legs. They breathe water. Their appendages are covered with dexterous grasping suckers, a structure for which no mammal has an equivalent. And not only are octopuses of the opposite side of the great vertebral divide that separates the backboned creatures such as mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish from everything else. They're classed within the invertebrates as mollusks or as slugs and snails and clams. Um, they don't even, clams don't even have brains and so on. So I started wondering what, what is the experience of an octopus? It's obviously having an experience yeah. because it lives. It has sex. It reproduces. I have no idea what that experience is. Then the other day I was reading about something, a creature called the painted lady, which is a, a, a butterfly of sorts. Mm -hmm. But the painted lady smells through her antenna. Um, she tastes through her feet. She has 30,000 lenses in her eyes which move like a kaleidoscope, giving her whatever experience 30,000 lenses can give. And um, what is that experience? What's the experience of a bat that only knows the echo of ultrasound? In other words, is there a reality or is, there, is this a species-specific experience? And what we call the universe with stars and galaxies, dark matter, are these just human constructs based on um, experience? So if I ask you, what is this? Before you can call it a hand, for a baby, this wouldn't be a hand. A baby who hasn't had language, this would be a shape, a color, maybe a smell. And then we say, you have a hand. and This is your body. That's the world. Yeah. And so now you have human constructs and these human constructs have moved through the ages from uh, mythology, stories, religion, stories, theology, another story, yeah. philosophy, another story, and now science, yeah. another story, right. right? But I don't think there's a universe, honestly. <laughs> I don't think there's something, something called a body. I don't think there's something called a mind. These are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in human consciousness, whatever that is. But we are a species of consciousness, just like that caterpillar is a species of consciousness, or a plant is a species of consciousness, or anything we can name. Anything we can name is a human construct, including the octopus. <laughs> we made up these names. We gave our experiences names. We gave them systems of thought from mythology to now science and technology. We believe science is the right story because we have the internet and these people can watch us mm. and science works, a jet plane works, we can send a rover to Mars. But is that reality? Is there such a thing as a body, mind and universe or is it just another story? I hate to say it, but I think we agree again. <laughs> What you're expressing to me, here's how I would put it. All our knowledge helps us, it illuminates the world, and at the same time, it obscures the world. Every time we think we understand something, we're prevented from seeing it in a different way. Um, 
You know, you said something that I'm sure you read Alan Watts, right? Yeah. And he would say, all ignorance and knowledge are the same thing. Because when you focus on something to know about it, you ignore everything else. And, and what you're expressing to me is something that comes up in mystical experiences. This is something I experienced, uh, as I said, on psychedelics, but also I went on a silent Buddhist retreat this summer and, I, and it was a profound experience for me. It was in some ways deeper than anything I'd experienced on psychedelics. And it made me realize how it's, it's like what you just said, um, but what I was also trying to express before, that this, all this reality, and you know, you and I, and all these other people out there, uh, the world, reality, um, cannot be captured by language. There's this wonderful field of theology, it's called negative theology. And the basic idea, the premise is that whatever you think God is, he or it is or she is not. God cannot be described. The Sufis say the same thing. Yeah, this is this is a core mystical um, principle uh, that to really understand reality is to know that it is it cannot be described. It cannot be understood in ways that we can even share with each other. So the challenge for me is to combine this revelation, which I absolutely believe with, at the same time, my belief in reason and in science, which does make progress in understanding certain things and does discover certain features about, about the universe. Those are sort of side by side in my head, and I haven't really reconciled them. Science is the most successful story, for sure. Yeah. But is it describing reality? Now, here's some questions that come up with uh, in these debates. Like I asked Michael Shermer the other day, a while ago, I said, what's a thought? Tell me what a thought is. He pointed here. He says, it's an electrochemical activity. I said, now that statement is also a thought, right? That it's an electro. So are you telling me that electrochemicals are making existential statements about themselves <laughs> right now? He didn't have an answer to that. You know, if you say, but here's what I'm saying, which is even more important, I think that anything that we've given a word or a description to is a human construct for a mode of knowing and experience in human consciousness. So before you can call this a book, it has to be an experience in consciousness. Yeah. And as an experience in consciousness, for lack of a better word, it's perceptual activity. And I think perceptual activity is just a modification of consciousness that sensations, whether it's the sensation of a color or the sensation of a sound or the sensation of a taste or sensation of a smell is a modified form of consciousness as that sensation. Mm -hmm. But consciousness can also modify itself as an image. I say, think of your girlfriend and you see an image. There's no image in your brain, but you see an image. Yeah. Think of your house, you see an image. Think of a beautiful sunset, you see an image. Where is that image? Mm -hmm. Or look at that painting, where is that experience happening? Obviously, there are photons coming from there to your eyes, but they don't have any color. Mm -hmm. They don't have any dimension. What's happening, there's no picture of the painting in your brain. Right. And actually, if you look at that picture and analyze it, it's made of atoms and probability waves. So where is this experience happening? For mm -hmm. lack of a better word, I would say it's happening in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And consciousness is modifying itself as experience. First, perceptual experience, sounds, colors, tastes, smells, and then mental experience, which is, oh, that's a painting, that's a statue, that's a body, that's a galaxy, a human construct for an experience. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there is only consciousness. Right. There's nothing else. Everything else is a human construct. And our experience is limited to human consciousness you don't have the experience of that bat or the octopus or whatever, that reality is infinite. And um, 
even God is a construct, a human construct, the way we describe God. Because as soon as we describe God, it can't be God. If God is infinite, then God, infinity cannot be imagined, right? Yeah. It can be put in an equation, but how do you imagine the infinite? Um, let me try to respond. You know, I've heard you talk about consciousness as the basis of reality. It's the only reality. And the only reality. And it appeals to part of me. But another part of me um, rejects it because of what I was saying before, that I can step out of myself and imagine what if an asteroid destroys, incinerates all life on Earth tomorrow, all of human civilization. Um, my best bet, the rational part of me, says that probably what that means is that, let's assume that we're the only um, inhabited planet in the universe. Let's just assume, we don't know. The universe will become uh, inanimate. It will become unconscious. It will exist only as matter. That's my best bet. The rational part of me tells me that. But so see, I, I'm telling you that matter is a construct. It doesn't actually yeah, exist. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I just don't buy it. Uh, now, part of me buys it. Uh, there's a part of me that, um, as a result of, uh, of a psychedelic trip I had in 1981, which I've written about quite a bit, uh, I concluded, and I really believed it for a while, and part of me still believes it, that everything, the entire, the, all of reality, uh, the whole universe, and humanity um, is, the, is the creation of a fearful God trying to escape from himself. It's, it's the product of a terrible identity crisis that God is going through, and we're the manifestations uh, we're like, uh, so God has multiple personality disorder. And we are God in drag. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that Ramda said many years ago. But here's... So that part of me thinks of what you're saying. Sure, why not? But then there's this other part of me, the hardcore, you know, I'm a scientific American writer for God's sake. I've got certain standards of evidence. Like what came before, science or consciousness? Uh, yeah, of course. Consciousness. Right? Uh, so science before. is an activity in consciousness, right? Observations are made in consciousness. But, Theories are conceived in consciousness. Experiments are designed in consciousness. But where does consciousness exist without matter? Non-local. Yeah. As, as potential. Yeah. Um, I, but, but, you know, there's still got to be a substrate of matter to, to generate the, the non-local effects. Um, this is an experience. <laughs> if you say that matter is independent of experience, mm -hmm. as most scientists say, by the way, yeah. one of the principles of scientific philosophy or philosophy of science is that any proposition that science makes should be either falsifiable or validated, right? Yeah. You either validate it or you falsify it. I think a, con a universe outside of consciousness is, cannot be validated or falsified. Yeah, I agree. These are fundamental philosophical and even spiritual principles that we're talking about. This is metaphysics. So we're talking about, you know, what this, this again gets back to the subjectivity I was talking about before. What seems sensible to you? Um, what seems consoling to you? For some people, materialism is very consoling. They don't want to think that consciousness persists forever because consciousness can be very difficult. You know, a lot of people suffer um, as conscious beings. I don't think it persists forever. I think it's not in time. It's timeless. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between something in time and something that's not in time. Time is an experience. Space-time is an experience in consciousness, yeah. right? I think this probably won't satisfy you, but I find your story very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I find a lot of, I find the counter story. And the rational, too. you know, the rational arguments that we make, <clears throat> we don't even know what the source of thought is. So how can we think 
what we call empirical facts are, I think, just a species-specific mode of experience and knowing. We call them empirical facts, but they're not an empirical fact. Uh, for a crocodile has no idea that there's something called a proton. We made it up. Here's we gave names to that experience, and we said, this is a proton, this is a Higgs boson, that's a probability wave, that's an action potential. It's, we made it up. In fact, we made up the whole idea that there is even a brain or a body or a universe. You know, yeah. what's his name? Anil Sait, the British uh, neuroscientist. He gave a TED talk recently uh -huh. where he said that the universe is a controlled hallucination produced by the brain. Yeah. So my question to him was, if the universe is a controlled hallucination produced by the brain, what is the brain? It's a controlled hallucination produced by other brains then, right? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Listen, I'm glad that you're messing with the heads of, uh, of the scientists. I, I want to point out to you that one of the greatest living philosophers, Thomas Nagel. You yeah, probably know. big fan of his. Yeah, me too. I, I asked him to uh, meet me, but he says he's He's frail right now. He does not do interviews. I wanted to interview him as well, and he turned me down, yeah. even though I'm, I'm, I'm a, a big huge, fan. Yeah. I am too. And he wrote this wonderful book called Mind and Cosmos. Correct. came I out read it. a few years ago. And he was making sort of some of the same points that you are. Not He wasn't saying, he wasn't um, giving metaphysical theories the way that you are. He was just pointing out the gross inadequacy of modern materialism, um, that when you put it all together, uh, all the different fields of science don't explain where the universe came from. They don't explain how life began on Earth. That's a total mystery, and they don't explain consciousness. Yes. So how? And meanwhile, other scientists like Richard Dawkins. I you know I hate to always pick on him, but I pick on him all the time. He's blocked me on Twitter, by the way. Well, he's he's just. He's he's foolish in the way that he says that science has explained everything, but because it's not even close. And Thomas Nagel is not a religious person. He's he's an atheist. An atheist yeah. uh, but he because, is. Because by the way, I also believe that God is a construct. It's a human construct. But infinity is not. Yeah, infinity and inter eternity. Um, Timelessness. We we create these concepts to, to almost to block them because they're. They make you dizzy. They give you vertigo. Uh, and you, meanwhile, you have to live your life. You have to you know, be with your family and you have to go to your job. Uh, I have to teach my students. And so if I'm always feeling the breeze of infinity blowing on me, it can be very disorienting. But now and then, now and then, I, I, I have to go back to it and feel it because it's invigorating too. Um, but I just wanted to, just to finish the point about Thomas Nagel, you and he are saying some different things. And he was he was ripped apart for I writing know, that book I by know. by some Everyone. by a lot I of read the New York Times. Yeah, very and unfairly. And I think in part because he was actually citing questions that some creationists you know, the problem is the creationists, they don't have the answers. Nobody has the answers. But the questions they ask about modern science are actually pretty good. Completely justified. Yeah. So, um, please read the book. First of all, it's free. You don't get that offer frequently. <laughs> also, it's good to be bewildered. I think uh, when you're bewildered, you have humility. I love this statement by the Sufi poet uh, Rumi. He says, exchange your cleverness for bewilderment. <laughs> and when you're bewildered, at least you have humility. And humility is a spiritual experience, for sure. Yeah, that's and great. And the I other thing I find consoling about the consciousness-only idea is that if you can dispense with matter, dispense with these ideas of body, mind, universe, and ground yourself in timeless being, in a sense you're free. Because then birth, death, God, all become just other constructs yeah. and you can stay grounded in infinity and then the way I think, partly because of my cultural upbringing, matter recycles, energy recycles, information recycles, but how do we know matter, energy and 
information because we're conscious beings. Mm -hmm. So why not consciousness recycling as the mind-body universe experience and evolving as the mind-body experience? I'm going to meditate on that uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> Look up John's book. Again, it's called Mind-Body Problems. You see the um, uh, link there. And give us your feedback. I know that a lot of you are uh, watching. Uh, please share this video with other friends. Give us your feedback, whether you agree, disagree, or maybe you have the solution to the mind-body problem.